Hello. Does it work? It works. Yes. So thank you very much, all of you, for coming to this lecture. I am truly touched that Internet Father Vint Cerf agreed as soon as that as soon as you all voted in large numbers last spring for the abstract on uh, big data and social media and what the impact on our lives can surreptitiously be. Vint, in his incredible ethics and kindness, uh, accepted and he did everything to fit crossing the Atlantic for us today. So it's uh, all over the web uh, how important Vint Surf is for the existence of the internet. Uh, I will only say three short things. He studied maths in Stanford. He worked for IBM. He went back to UCLA to do his uh, master's and PhD. He co-authored TCPIP protocols. He found the ICANN, the Corporation for Assigning Numbers and Names. He founded, he co-founded the Internet Society. And he has always been such a wonderful and easy person to receive advice from. I am a witness from 89 when our internet pioneer here, Ben Siegel, presented me to, to Vint Surf and Vint corrected a paper I wrote on X500 attributes. So I would like to leave the floor for maximum uh, uh, advantage for us from his wisdom and for time for questions at the end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You know, I always worry when people clap before you said anything. I think you should just sit down because it won't get any better than that. Uh, so thank you all very much for allowing me to take uh, some of your time today to talk about big data and social media. I don't want to give you the impression that I'm necessarily uh, a great expert on this topic, but I do have some thoughts and I will share them with you. Uh, but I think uh, our dialogue uh, after these formal remarks uh, will be important. One thing I should warn you about, I'm hearing impaired, I wear two hearing aids, and I'm not sure of the quality of the sound that I will get down here. So if I have trouble uh, understanding the question, I'll probably ask Maria to uh, reproduce that. But that suggests that you should not ask really, really long questions, because she won't be able to. Uh, so, so ask a question, don't make a speech. Um, I'm, I'm, I get to make the speech. That's, okay, so, so now we, have, we know what each other have a responsibility for. Second, I think uh, I want to again acknowledge the origins of the World Wide Web here at CERN. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Kao were very much uh, a part of uh, that. Uh, I also think it's fair to uh, remember that uh, this was not a formal project that was necessarily sponsored by CERN, uh, although CERN now uh, understandably takes credit for the fact that it did take place here, that this development was done uh, during the late 80s and early 90s. Uh, but in a sense, a lot of what's happened in the internet is a consequence of people just going off and doing something as opposed to trying to get permission to do it. Grace Hopper, who is a very famous uh, person in the history of computing, often uh, said it was easier to beg for forgiveness than it was to ask for permission. And, and so many people, including uh, Tim and uh, Robert, uh, have taken up that, uh, that view uh, it, very successfully. Uh, similarly, uh, at the National Center for Supercomputer Applications, uh, Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina, after having seen the uh, original World Wide Web release uh, by Tim Berners-Lee, um, invented their version of the browser called Mosaic, which was a graphical uh, browser. And that caught everyone's attention. That, too, was not a formally sponsored project, although NCSA is very proud now of the fact that this project was undertaken there. 
uh, a man named Jim, uh, James Clark, or Jim Clark, uh, who had founded a company called Silicon Graphics, saw the Mosaic browser and instantly realized that this was a big deal, went to uh, Illinois and brought Mark Andreessen and Eric Bina and others to the West Coast where they founded Netscape Communications. And of course, it, uh, its story is equally important because the, the company started in 1994, they went public in 1995 and the stock went through the roof. This ignited the so-called dot boom, where billions of dollars of venture capital was thrown at anything that had anything to do with the internet. Of course, by April of 2000, uh, it was discovered that many of those companies didn't have a business model that made any sense. And so there was the so-called dot bust when many of those companies went out of business. Nonetheless, the internet continued to grow dramatically uh, during that period because it's, uh, its utility was apparent, and certainly the World Wide Web grew very dramatically. Uh, the company I work for now, Google, was founded just before that dot bust in 1998, uh, when there was a great deal of energy going into web-related uh, activity. So uh, what I'd like to do now is to take you back in time uh, to the earliest stages pre-internet, just as a reminder of how things uh, went. So this is what the predecessor of the internet, the ARPANET, looked like in 1969. This was a project of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency um, to experiment with the use of packet switching to share information and access to computing resources uh, among about a dozen universities that were being funded by ARPA to study artificial intelligence and computer science technology. Every year, these uh, dozen computer science departments said, you have to buy us a world-class computer every year so we can continue to do world-class research. And those of you who may recall the cost of computing in the late 60s, we're talking about multi-million dollar devices. And so even ARPA wasn't able to buy a dozen uh, state-of-the-art computers for all of the computer science departments. So ARPA said, we're going to build a network and you're going to share. So this was a resource sharing experiment to link dis disparate computer systems to each other through a common homogeneous packet switch network. So the packet switching part was also quite important. The telecommunications wisdom of the time was that circuit switching is how you did communications like the telephone system. And frankly, that would have taken too long for the uh, computers to dynamically share data back and forth to service remote users who were scattered around the net. You didn't want to dial up the, com the computer, establish a circuit, type a few lines, kill the circuit, dial up another one. It just would have been completely inefficient. The telecom engineers in the telephone business said packet switching would never work and it would certainly never carry voice, and it couldn't possibly carry video. They were wrong. And so the important thing to take away from this part of the story is that wisdom isn't always right, and that sometimes technology changes the world, and this is one example of that. So the original ARPANET uh, project uh, I participated in as a graduate student. I wrote the software that, uh, that went into the Sigma 7 machine uh, that's in a museum now. Some people think I should be in the museum, but I'm not. I'm here. I'm in, so uh, and I'm happy uh, to be here. So this was the uh, initial project. Then um, we grew the internet protocols because after the success of the ARPANET project, uh, my colleague Robert Kahn, who worked very much on the architecture of the ARPANET, went to ARPA from the company he had been at, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, and realized that if we were going to use computers in command and control, which was of great interest to ARPA, that we would have to put those computers in ships at sea, uh, in mobile vehicles, and in aircraft. But the ARPANET had been built on dedicated telephone circuits and packet switch nodes. You can't connect tanks together with wires, and the airplanes don't make it off the ground, and the ships get all tangled up. So we had to use satellite and radio. So by the time Bob Kahn came to my operation at Stanford University, he had this problem of multiple packet switch nets needing to be interconnected in a way to make them look uniform. 
despite the fact that they had different data rates in each of the nets, different uh, latencies, satellite, synchronous satellite being a quarter of a second up and down. Uh, they had different error rates, especially the mobile radio system where you had radio shadow and radio interference and everything else. So he said, our problem is how to design a system that looks uniform regardless of how many networks and what their characteristics are. Well, that led to the internet design, which took us about six months. Uh, from spring of 73 to the fall of 73, we worked on a design. We published a paper, which uh, came out in uh, May of 1974 in uh, Transactions on Communications in the IEEE, describing what this would look like and how the protocols would work. In the meantime, starting in January of 74, I had a team of graduate students working on the detailed design of the TCP protocols, which we completed in December of 74 and published as RFC 675. And then we began implementation. And so we had three different sites at Stanford University, at University College London, uh, and at Bolt Baranek and Newman in Cambridge, Massachusetts, all implementing independent implementations of TCP protocols. We very quickly discovered errors and mistakes that we had made in the logic. We uh, cycled through four different iterations of the TCP protocols, and in the third iteration, a very strong argument was made that we needed to split the functionality of TCP into two parts. The internet protocol layer, which was not reliable, but it was fast and delivered traffic as quickly as possible uh, without guarantee. And the TCP protocol, which put everything back in order, retransmitted if necessary, filtered out duplicates, so that we could support real-time communication. What we were thinking was voice, video, radar, and other things that require low latency and can tolerate loss, but can't tolerate increasing delay. So anybody who's ever had a, a voice conversation over a double satellite hop will know what I mean, how you step on each other because of the delay. So uh, we uh, split the TCP IP uh, protocols into those two parts, implemented it, and then in 1977, uh, we tested this with three different networks, the mobile packet radio network in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area, the packet satellite network over the Atlantic, uh, and uh, the ARPANET, which by this time uh, had spread across the Atlantic to Europe. Another thing I want to emphasize for you is that the participation in the development of the Internet was international from the very beginning. I had in my laboratory at Stanford researchers from Japan, from France, uh, from Norway uh, uh, and participation remotely from Italy and Germany. So uh, we had an international network working group which was formed in 1972 to explore this possibility of a large scale packet switch network, a uh, global uh, packet switch net made up of different, uh, different uh, networks. So this was a very important milestone for all of us to demonstrate that the TCP IP protocols would actually make this disparate set of networks look uniform. The National Science Foundation in the U.S. got very much involved in this in the early 1980s uh, and then uh, with the CSNet effort and then in the mid-1980s with the NSFNet backbone, uh, which was intended to collect, connect about 3,000 universities around the United States. They cleverly decided not to make one backbone that had to deal with 3,000 different universities, so they actually posited intermediate level networks which would serve groups of universities. So the people who ran the NSFNet backbone only had to deal with a dozen or so different networks as opposed to 3,000 individual universities. Setting the stage for the later commercialization of the net as multiple networks all interconnected to each other. Of course, this was only feasible because the internet design assumed that there would be multiple networks that were interconnected and the paths would be generated from end uh, source to destination. So this was a very big uh, injection of capital uh, and, and scale uh, into the internet environment. Concurrent with the NSFNet activity, the Department of Energy built ESNet, Energy Sciences Net, and NASA built the NASA Science Internet. And so we had four major backbone networks in operation in the US for a period of time from the Defense Department, NASA, DOE, uh, and uh, NSF. So this set the stage for what we see now, which is a gigantic hundreds of thousands of networks all interconnected together. 
the, uh, there, this is uh, a global system of more than a half million networks. Uh, the different colors just represent different uh, jurisdictions in the environment. What's important about the picture is that there's no central control. The system is essentially fully distributed. All the routing protocols are run in a distributed way. If there's any centralization at all, it's found at the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They don't operate the network, but what they do is allocate IP address space and domain names in such a way that they are uniquely assigned. So you don't assign the same IP space to two different parties. You don't assign a domain name to two different parties. That's all. It's there simply to assure uniqueness of the identifier spaces of the Internet. Of course, the only reason this works at all is that everybody has chosen to adopt the TCP IP protocols. They choose which software to use. They choose which hardware to use. They decide who to connect with and on what terms and conditions. Uh, we don't uh, centrally decide any of that. And of course, this is now true on a global scale. So this is the platform on top of which the World Wide Web runs. And it's the platform uh, through which massive amounts of data and huge amounts of social networking take place. So let's talk about that. First of all, it is not a surprise. I'm going to get the water. <clears throat> it's not a surprise that social, that networking produces social effects. And the reason that uh, I can tell you this is this first bullet. Email was developed on the ARPANET in 1971. Uh, a guy named, um, now I'm going to draw a blank. OK, Ben. It's, geez, he just passed away, too. This is embarrassing. I'll think of it in a minute. Anyway, uh, it was, it's not Bill Palmer. It's the other guy. Ah, anybody want to just Google that? Who's the guy that invented email? And remind me. Anyway, this was invented in 1971 as a kind of experiment, and it instantly caught on. Everybody realized the utility of, uh, of being able to have computer-mediated communication because the two parties who were communicating didn't have to be awake at the same time. And what this did for those of us working on the ARPANET project is allow us to interact with our colleagues over many, much, many more time zones than would normally be feasible. Uh, and that allowed uh, the project to incorporate a larger number of participants over a larger geographic uh, distance. And in fact, we thought that the introduction of electronic mail would actually reduce the need for travel because we would be able to uh, correspond uh, remotely and asynchronously. About four years after the, the uh, development of, uh, of email, we looked at the travel budget and discovered it had gone up, not down. And we asked, why is this? And the answer turned out to be because the projects got bigger and involved a larger number of people because of the asynchronous communication. And when we had meetings, which we still had to have, more people came from farther away, so the budgets went up. The uh, social effects showed up in the form of mailing lists. And the two that I remember earliest in the story of email lists is sci-fi lovers, science fiction readers. Think of it, we were all engineers and geeks, and of course we all read science fiction. And we had our opinions about who were the best authors and what were the best stories. So this mailing list debated that. And then there was a restaurant evaluation mailing list called Yum Yum. It was started at Stanford and it covered restaurants in the Palo Alto area and eventually expanded to a larger area. So it was evident very early on that this kind of asynchronous communication had social utility and social characteristics to it. The second thing which is very important is that Douglas Engelbart uh, was at SR International. He was supported by J.C.R. Lichtweiter in MIT, who became the first director of the Information Processing Techniques Office of ARPA. Both of them absolutely convinced that computing could be used for non-numerical purposes for the sharing of information, for collaborative work. And Engelbart instantiated that vision in something called the online system and did a demonstration in 1968, in December, on the 9th of December, 1968, almost 50 years ago, showing what the online system could do. This has now become known as the mother of all demos. It, it had a standing ovation at the end that you don't normally see tech uh, demonstrations like this producing st a standing ovation. So um, Engelbart, in effect, 
had uh, a World Wide Web in a box. And this is not to diminish anything that, uh, that Tim and his colleagues had done, but the idea was that people would generate documents, they would share them in this uh, system, they would be able to give labels to each of the documents and you could use the mouse, which Engelbart had to invent in order to point to things on the screen with a, with a control on it so you could click on the mouse to say, go to that document. Doesn't that sound familiar? But we're talking about the late 60s when he was doing this. So we were using his online system in the normal course of our documentation of the ARPANET and later the Internet Project. So that's another uh, evidence of the kind of social networking uh, and information sharing that was going on that long ago. There was Usenet was yet another manifestation uh, of a communication system that was established in 1980, so now many, many years ago, uh, and it involved, other than internet protocols, to link computers together using dial-up modems and the distribution of uh, contributions from all the various participants. This uh, split up into various topics, and you could find a variety of, of topics of interest that people would make contributions ab about. And so, once again, showing evidence of its social uh, character. And spam shows up uh, for the first time, another phenomenon, uh, on the ARPANET. Uh, this guy, Gary Thurk, who is digital, at Digital Equipment Corporation, sent to one of the mailing lists a job offer, the job description. And there was a small nuclear explosion at the ARPA Information Processing Techniques Office when this happened because this was not supposed to be used for any commercial purpose whatsoever. This was a research system. It was designed for research support and uh, for uh, eventually for uh, you know, Defense Department applications and, and certainly not for, uh, for commercial purposes. Uh, so uh, we, didn't, uh, have, we didn't see too much more spam of that kind for quite a while. Uh, the well is another uh, well-known, no pun intended, place uh, on the net. Initially, a, a dial-up uh, kind of um, uh, bulletin board system uh, started by Stuart Brand and Larry Brilliant, who were two good friends of mine, uh, in 1985. And so yet again, another example. That one has persisted. The well still exists. So we're talking 33 years now and counting. And then finally, uh, in the U.S. anyway, there were a number of other companies that started online services, typically using dial-up modems, Podigy, AOL, CompuServe, <coughs> hundreds of bulletin boards and things like that, all reachable during the 1980s. So there was a lot going on in the networking space in addition to ARPANET and Internet uh, in those years, many of these manifestations having a great deal of social impact. Uh, of course, the social impact today is even more uh, dramatic. Let me uh, shift over to big data for just a moment. Every one of you in this room knows how much data is generated by the Large Hadron Collider, so I don't need to say anything about that particularly, except to say that uh, there is a big challenge ahead, not only in the processing of the data, but in its preservation over long periods of time. So digital preservation is a huge issue for scientific data. Uh, those uh, people who are in the astronomical uh, field uh, know this uh, for sure uh, because we've accumulated a huge amount of uh, imagery, uh, radio signatures and the like from a variety of different telescopes and, and more are being built as we speak like the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope that will probably produce petabytes of data per day uh, as it does surveys of a large portion of the sky. Another thing uh, is genetic information. The Human Genome Project uh, was, it, it, you remember Watson and Crick in the 1950s discovering the structure of DNA, leading to a great deal of, of interest in uh, sequencing uh, the DNA of you know, all species, in particular humans, with the expectation that once we knew what our DNA was, that we could actually understand the origins of disease. And so this was the, uh, the fantasy, and I use that word deliberately, that, that we had, that if we just knew the sequence of DNA of a human being, we could tell everything there was uh, to, needed to be known about that person's health and, uh, and potential future. Well, that turns out to be wrong. Uh, after we finish, finished sequencing uh, the human uh, genome, uh, it, we were standing on a mountaintop discovering that there were more mountaintops that had to be climbed. 
In particular, DNA gets used when it's interpreted to produce proteins, tens of thousands of them. And so now the question is, which proteins are being produced and under what conditions and why are they, you know, how are they used? And so there was the notion of the proteome, which is all the proteins and accounting for all of that. And so then we're done, right? Wrong. Then we discover that human beings are not made up just of their own DNA. Because in the gut, we have a wide range of microflora, as, you know, bacteria, that have evolved, co-evolved along with us. They are integral to our immune system, and they certainly, if they don't work, we can't digest food and we would die. So the, the microbiome is equally important and has hundreds of times, well, at least 100 times more DNA than the human sequence. And so suddenly we have to sequence everything that's uh, in the gut flora and then do the proteome and, and so on. And then we're done. Wrong. That's not true either. Because all of these are living organisms. And every living organism produces output. And looking at the detritus of life, the things that happen as a result of metabolism, turns out to tell us something about the state of our human bodies and how well or poorly they're functioning, kind of like examining the exhaust of a car and instrumenting the car to understand how the engine is working and how the brake linings are worn down or how the tires are, are wearing, wearing down and so on. So suddenly all of that information is needed in order to do a good job of assessing health and health prospects. So that's big data in, in spades. Um, before the World Wide Web came along, there was already a recognition that content on the network was growing rapidly and that people couldn't find anything. So there were efforts like the Wide Area Information System and Gopher and Archie uh, that were trying to use files and file names as the way of discovering content on the net. But I think every one of you can appreciate that a file name is a very limited piece of information. It doesn't tell us a whole lot about what's going on inside the file. And so the arrival of the World Wide Web opened up a vista of content analysis and indexing uh, that was manifest in many ways. AltaVista, for example, which spun out of Digital Equipment Corporation, uh, Yahoo, Google, Bing, Baidu, and China, among many others. Uh, did this just stop? Yeah. It's back again. <laughs> Why does it do that? I don't know. OK. something. <laughs> Something funny. We're not running the collider right now, are we? I mean, it doesn't produce weird you know, side effects uh, in the radio frequency band. OK, so anyway, um, the, um, these various uh, indexing tools uh, became really powerful mechanisms for discovering content on the net as long as it was in HTML. However, there's a huge amount of dark information in the network, and I don't mean by this the dark web. That's a different, uh, I'll talk about that, but, uh, but it's a different issue. It's just information that's not in HTML form, and it's not indexed by the web crawlers. That, too, is very important. It's sort of like dark matter and dark energy in the universe. It's there, but we're having trouble sensing it. So there's a lot of content on the net that's sitting in databases. And in order to find out what's in there, you, know, you actually have to query the database. But you can't imagine the crawler going through, stopping at every database and asking a million questions to figure out what's in there. So we actually need to have ways of describing what's in the databases so that the index can tell us there exists a database that has this kind of content. So we need metadata about much of this information in order to make discovery more effective. And now we get to the modern uh, social media on the network, like Twitter and Instagram, and Facebook, Google+, Snapchat, WeChat, QQ, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, all of this uh, is manifest evidence that uh, people who are online have a great desire to share information with other people. Some, some people do this because they're looking for positive feedback. They're looking to know that the content that they've shared is useful to somebody else. That's what led to a great deal of uh, web page um, construction during the early stages of World Wide Web. Since we didn't have these other social media in place, people wanted to share their knowledge. And they did so not to be compensated uh, you know, uh, monetarily, but they did so because they wanted to know that their information was useful to someone else. 
Uh, that same driver uh, occurs in the, uh, in the social media as well. So uh, we have this um, incentive for pouring increasing amounts of information on the net, uh, notwithstanding the fact that a lot of that is personal information and there are side effects of it sharing in such a broad way and something that we should talk about with, with regard to policy. Uh, another thing which accumulates data on the net, of course, is e-commerce information. If you look at Amazon or eBay or Yelp or Alibaba, just in the, in the course of carrying out uh, transactions on the net, buying and selling and shipping and so on, a lot of information gets accumulated that's specific to a person, like an address, for example, or a phone number or an email address. Uh, the very material that they're buying uh, is potentially personal information. And so one becomes more concerned over time with the amount of information that these companies have about individuals and their behavior. Uh, this is true of Google and, other, and Facebook and others. Uh, at Google, for example, those people who are using our Gmail system, that are using our uh, file system, our Google Docs system, are entrusting to Google their email and the documents that they create, the spreadsheets and the word processing documents and, uh, and their presentations and the like. So there is uh, an understandable concern with regard to big data about the protection of personal information. Of course, here in, uh, in Switzerland, uh, there are legal discussions about legal protections. And of course, the EU just recently announced its general data protection uh, regulations, uh, which are intended to protect people's privacy. Uh, and then finally, with regard to uh, large quantities of data, just environmental systems that are gathering data about the atmosphere or seismic information and the like, water quality, uh, also produce a lot of information. So here's this gigantic list of content that gets grow is growing uh, over time and has to be managed one way or another. So trying to tame this stuff and make it accessible to computer algorithms is one of the things that Google, among others, uh, is confronted with. So we developed uh, two things uh, over the course of the last couple of decades. One was called Big Table, which is a vastly larger database system than the conventional uh, kinds of databases that uh, were common uh, in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, and Spanner, which is the uh, replacement for Big Table, which is able to handle even larger quantities of information. Uh, the whole idea here is to allow uh, these large databases to be processed concurrently by a large number of processors. So as an example, the World Wide Web Index, uh, which is generated continuously at Google by this crawler thing, the, crawler, the crawl is being done concurrently by multiple processors. The index is built, it's distributed and replicated, uh, and we use uh, techniques to help find things in the net once we built the index. So if we say, has anybody found any web page with the following strings on it, uh, we blast that information out to a large number of processors that have portions of the index available, and the ones that find anything raise their hands, and then we assemble all that information, and then rank order it and present the answers to the users who are doing search, for example. Uh, so that's turned out to be a really powerful tool for applying uh, software techniques to large quantities of data. We, we now see many companies who are using our cloud platform and of course uh, others at Amazon and uh, Microsoft, for example, uh, in order to process significant, amount of con significant amounts of content. And of course you have to do this here with the Large Hadron Collider data. And you have to do it faster than anybody else because of the, the 40 nanoseconds or so that you have between cycles of collision in the system you get huge amounts of calor uh, calorimeter data that you have to filter in real time because there isn't any time to do anything else. So you have hardware at the, at the core uh, of your sensor systems in order to uh, choose which events are going to become part of the more long-term record uh, for subsequent analysis. Another thing uh, which uh, Google has pursued uh, vigorously, partly with the help of DeepMind, which is one of our organizations in London, uh, is the construction of multi-layer neural networks. Some of you who know the history of artificial intelligence may know that very uh, early on in the 1960s, there were efforts to build neural networks, but they were one layer deep. And one of those systems was called a perceptron. Basically, it took in image input 
uh, and then did some kind of uh, computational analysis uh, and then produced an output. And uh, two people at uh, researchers, uh, Marvin Minsky and, uh, ah, here we go with names again. Uh, I hate it when this happens. I hope everybody else has the same experience so I don't feel like the only person in the room that can't remember people's names. <sighs> anyway, so uh, Minsky and Papert, Seymour Papert, uh, wrote a book called Perceptrons and described why they were weak in terms of any interesting ability to do uh, image analysis and uh, network analysis and things like that. They destroyed neural uh, network research for about a decade because of that book. Uh, some people persisted, however, and when we got to the point where we could actually build you know, hundreds of neural networks, hundreds of layers deep, uh, affordably, that we discovered how powerful these multi-layer systems could be. And so at Google, uh, we invested both in hardware and in software techniques in order to explore what a neural network could do. Uh, we offer this service, it's called TensorFlow. The devices themselves are tensor processing units, and we've been through three or four iterations of the hardware. Uh, some of you uh, may have seen some of the uh, reports that have come out of applications using this hardware. Uh, one system is called AlphaGo, and I'm sure many of you remember the uh, Go games that were played against uh, the Koreans and the Chinese successfully. Uh, with the AlphaGo system. The more dramatic thing happened a few months ago. AlphaGo Zero is a multi-layer neural network algorithm which does not get trained at all by playing human games. It just plays against itself. And what was quite surprising is that within a few weeks, AlphaGo Zero was able to play Go better than any of our other AlphaGo systems had played and therefore in theory, could beat any human player. In a few hours, it learned how to play chess well enough to beat other computer chess programs. And so AlphaGo Zero is an algorithm of great power, but very narrow in focus. And part of my uh, point that I want to make here is that uh, the narrowness and brittleness of these algorithms is very important for you to keep in mind. I can imagine perhaps training neural networks to recognize uh, data arising out of the Large Hadron Collider experiments. But the, the brittleness in here is very important. Some of you will know about adversarial images. This is where you train a system to recognize a bunch of different animals, you know, cats, dogs, kangaroos, and so on. Uh, and then you build another uh, neural network to try to compose an image by changing a few pixels that will confuse the other one. So this is the adversarial nature. And uh, examples uh, of this are systems that have been designed to recognize cats and dogs and so on. By changing a few pixels, it's possible to cause an image that looks to you like a dog, but the image recognition system thinks it's a kangaroo because of just a few pixel changes. And for those of you who uh, prefer the more mathematical view, think for a moment about an image. Every pixel in the image is a different dimension in a hyperdimensional space. And when you do the training to separate one image class from another, you're putting hyperplanes into this, uh, this multidimensional space. And every pixel is, uh, or every image is in fact made up of a vector in that hyperdimensional space. So the planes are separating the vectors. Changing a few pixels can move a vector across one of the hyperplanes. And so even these in, indetectable to the human eye changes can cause a vector to move just enough to be misclassified. So I point this out because I want people who right now are running around saying multi-layer neural networks are going to solve all the problems of the world to recognize that they are brittle and narrow in their functionality. So let us be careful about that. Um, I have an example from uh, natural language uh, translation. Uh, we had great success in applying neural networks to the translation of natural languages. And I had an experience with this while I was in Heidelberg last year. Uh, I looked up the weather 
in Heidelberg. Now, because I was in Heidelberg, the Google search took me to a German weather site. But because I had set my Chrome browser up to translate anything that wasn't English into English, it translated the website into English so quickly that I didn't realize I was on a German site. Until I looked at the actual weather prediction, it said zero chance of rain, zero chance of fog, and zero chance of ice cream. <laughs> and so I immediately took a screenshot and took it to my friends and said, you have ice cream storms here? <laughs> uh, of course, it was ice, E-I-S, and it was misunderstood as not as hail, but as ice cream. Uh, probably because most of the documents that uh, had ice, E-I-S, in them probably was referring to ice cream and not hail. So I sent a copy of the screenshot to my natural language uh, uh, teams at, uh, at Google saying, you have some work to do. There's still a little bit of a problem here. Uh, another thing which is, uh, which is uh, upon us now is the Internet of Things, and you are surely well aware of that. Uh, in some sense, the Large Hadron Collider is the ultimate thing because it is all instrumentation, and it gathers huge amounts of data. But we're going to see billions of devices, none of them on the scale of uh, the Large Hadron Collider, but in aggregate will be producing large quantities of information, which is quite valuable, but also potentially hazardous to accumulate. And so just to give you a tiny example, given that I'm going to run out of time here, um, it, let's take temperature information. Now, in my house, I have temperature sensors in each room in the house. Actually, they detect uh, the light level, the humidity, and the temperature. And every five minutes, they package up that information and transmit it through a little mesh radio network to a server in the basement. So at the end of the year, I have really good statistical data about how well the heating and ventilation and air conditioning system works. I know, only a geek would do that. But the, the, the point here is that I have good engineering data from this. But let's imagine for just a moment that the temperature information is available to someone else someone I didn't intend it to be available to. Looking at that information over a period of months, you might be able to figure out how many people live in the house, which rooms do they occupy, what are their diurnal, uh, weekly, monthly cycles, or can I tell whether they're at home or not, uh, and use that information if they wanted to break into the house. And so I don't want that information to be in the hands of anyone I haven't authorized, which means I now have an access control problem to deal with. Let me give you another example, webcams. Webcams can be very uh, helpful, especially if you're away and you want to go and make sure the house is okay, nobody's broken in, and so on. You certainly don't want other people to get access to that information. On the other hand, there are circumstances where you actually want a stranger to have access to the webcam. The house is on fire, the fire department is on the way, you want the fire department to have access to the webcam to see if there's anyone unconscious in one of the rooms or can see where the fire has uh, ignited. But after the fire is out, you don't want them to have continued access to that. So there are certain conditions where you want episodic uh, access, uh, but the ability to revoke uh, the access uh, at the appropriate time. We could make similar arguments about health information, uh, about um, uh, you know, other, oh, the police department coming because the house has been broken into. So information of this kind, while it's sensitive, uh, has to be treated in a fairly, um, let's say, nuanced way uh, if, it's going to, if, if we are going to realize the benefits of having accumulated all that information. Now, there, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm going to try, uh, since I'm not using my own laptop. In fact, I know it's not going to work. It's too bad. There is a presentation of multivariate information called Gapminder. It's about a three-minute presentation. Um, in the interest of time and the fact that it's, this is on a different laptop than the one that I put the video on, uh, we'll go to the next slide, and it's not going to work. So we'll go to the next slide. Go to Just do a Google search on Gapminder. If you haven't seen this, it's worth your attention. They are able to take time series and animate them. Uh, with something like five or six different variables being simultaneously presented in one chart and being shown in a dynamic way because of the time series. So here are some of the new challenges that show up, the ones that I'm sure you were thinking of when you were talking about big data and social networking. One of them is the injection of misinformation and disinformation into the social media networks. This is actually a, a serious problem. Uh, uh, we feel it most... Uh, specifically, 
uh, as a consequence of our 2016 uh, presidential elections, where it's becoming increasingly apparent that Russians uh, were, and I hope I haven't insulted anybody here, but the Russians uh, are, are getting credit for having injected a great deal of misinformation to stir up unrest and to uh, generate a lot of uh, uh, conflict, political conflict, uh, during the uh, period run up to the elections. This is a general problem. It's not just a specific one related to elections. Uh, there are people who deliberately put misinformation into the system. There are other people who, out of ignorance, put misinformation into the system. And so we have this problem of trying to distinguish good quality content from bad quality content. And the only way I know to do that is called critical thinking. And so I am a great advocate of teaching young people how to think critically about the content that they encounter, whether it's on the internet or in newspapers or magazines or television or movies or their friends. Thinking critically about this is important, but it also takes time and effort. Not everyone is willing to do that. I know you're wondering, how am I going to get down to uh, the end of this without uh, running out of time, but I'll try anyway. So, uh, so my solution, partial solution to this problem, is to teach everyone, and especially young people, to deliberately think critically about the information they encounter. Where did this come from? Is there any corroborating evidence? Uh, what was the motivation for putting this information into the system? Could there possibly have been some ulterior motive? in placing that information into uh, a social networking environment or into a web page somewhere. The other thing which is really tough has to do with the uh, feedback loops that are created by the social media. The positive feedback loops are the ones where people share information and get back a positive response saying, thank you, that information was very helpful to me. It makes people feel like they're contributing to the society. But there are other bad things that people use the media for, for bullying and stalking and doxing and addiction. People get addicted to the feedback they get. Anyone who's ever observed vandalism in the physical world will appreciate that there is some negative feedback, or it's a positive feedback loop with negative consequences where vandals get this great satisfaction out of doing harm and doing so in a way that they can't be uh, identified. And so that's why vandalism on the streets, you know, or you know, writing on the sides of buildings generates a peculiar positive feedback loop for people who find this uh, either amusing or oddly satisfying. So uh, we have the negative potential of these online media. There's also the positive side, though. Uh, corporations, for example, that use the social media in order to be helpful to people, helping them find healthcare information, helping them improve their financial well-being, helping them to set up new businesses or to find financial support for startups and things like that are, are also potential positive side effects of these online environments. So we're going to have to wrestle with this uh, as a global society. Digital literacy is related to this. It's helping people understand both the benefits and the hazards of being online and to be prepared for the possibility that things don't work the way uh, that they expect. Uh, for example, in the Internet of Things uh, is made up of devices that have software in them and to which we have given autonomy to make decisions. And I get nervous, as a former programmer, knowing how easy it is to write software that has bugs and how hard it is to find the bugs this is why I think every kid should learn how to program just to have the experience of having to track down a bug in the software and to have to experience the thinking that's needed. So digital literacy says devices that have software in them should be looked at with a certain degree of uh, suspicion that they will not always work the way they are supposed to uh, and be prepared uh, for that. There's, I, have, I have this huge, long, you know, multi-hour rant about digital preservation which I will shrink down to a little bit because I've already in, implied how important it is. I'm worried that a lot of the digital content that we create today will not be around in 100 years, or maybe even 50 years. And the worry comes both from the media, which may not preserve the bits as long as we would like, or if the bits are preserved in the media, we don't have any readers left to still read it. So some of us still have five and a quarter inch floppy disks gathering dust in the closet or three and a half inch floppy disks, 
or VHS tapes, for which we can't find a reader anymore, uh, or CDs, for which uh, you know, our laptops don't have a reader anymore. There are a whole series of shifts in digital media. Finding readers may be a problem, but even if you have a reader, you have another problem. What if you need software in order to correctly interpret the bits? For example, a spreadsheet or a video game. Well, now we have the problem that 10 years from now or 50 years from now, the software won't run on the hardware of the day or won't run on the operating systems of the day. And the question, and maybe the people that made that software have gone out of business, so they aren't even trying to upgrade the software to run on what would then be current operating systems and hardware. So in order to preserve a lot of this digital information, we're going to have to build emulators for old hardware to run old operating systems, to run old applications. We're going to have to uh, encourage companies that make this software to continue to make it backward compatible or to upgrade the software to run on new operating systems. I think there's going to have to be some corporate responsibility. Otherwise, an awful lot of digital content that you have gone to the trouble of creating may get lost. By the way, for those of you who take lots of pictures with your mobiles, many people come to me and say, what should I do with them? I'm worried about having them 10, 20 years from now for, for my uh, extended family. And my advice is find good quality photo print paper and print the images that you want to save. Because we know that images of that kind can last 150 years because we have evidence of that. We have no evidence that any piece of digital technology will last 150 years. So that's my answer for people wondering what to do. Um, in a f just a few minutes uh, here, international law enforcement, um, it's, uh, it's beneficial in some sense uh, and fortuitous that we're standing in Geneva. This is a place where discussions about international law uh, have been historically important and common. And it's my belief that we are going to have to adopt norms and principles and eventually legal frameworks in order to protect people from harm in the global internet environment. The harms can be visited upon victims by people in one jurisdiction, uh, which is, could be uh, you know, a separate country, for example and the victims in another country. So figuring out how to cope with that, how to provide law enforcement with the information it needs, and how to concurrently protect people's privacy is going to be a really tough challenge. And as the GDPR uh, is implemented and impl as, as it spreads, uh, I think we will encounter collisions with these two <laughs> very desirable outcomes, the protection of privacy and the protection of safety in online environments. So this is a place where those discussions could readily happen. I don't mean CERN, but I'm thinking of the United Nations in particular. Um, I've already alluded to the problems of malware and buggy software. Um, the reason that, we, that malware exists is that we're not very good at writing software to avoid uh, exploitable bugs. And then unfortunately, because the general public is on the network, uh, we have people who want to exploit those bugs for their nefarious purposes. And so we have to figure out how to build better software, how to design tools that let us uncover bugs before they get loose. This has been a problem for the last 70 or 80 years. We've never been able to write software that has no bugs. And so a research task, in my view, is to figure out new frameworks for designing and building software that has less likelihood of introducing bugs, exploitable bugs, into the environment. Which leads to an ethics issue, and that is whether companies and programmers in particular should feel a deep ethical responsibility for the code that they produce. Too often, the programmers have said, oh, it's just a bug. Like, I didn't really mean to do that. It wasn't intentional, so it's just a bug. My reaction to this is, you can't get away with that forever. At some point, being the party that made the bug, made the mistake, ought to have consequences. The thing that makes this so difficult is that now, in the programming world that we're familiar with, huge numbers of libraries are swept into the software that are being produced. And the catering of the library and its accuracy and its bug-free uh, character is getting harder and harder to do. So we have a lot of work ahead of us to try to uh, eliminate or at least reduce 
uh, the presence of exploitable mistakes in software. And I think that there should be uh, a real ethical feeling here and maybe even uh, consequences associated with the production of exploitable buggy software, which means that uh, we may need to visit upon companies uh, some side effects of having allowed bugs to be released or have fail, having failed to provide for updates of the software. The IoT space is going to be rife with this problem, especially somebody who makes an IoT device like a webcam, sells it to you, and then disappears and says, I have your money, I don't need to do anything else. And we're saying, wait a minute, you're supposed to stay around to fix the bugs. So that leads to things like source code and wanting that to be openly available so the bugs get found and can be fixed even if it's not by the party that made the equipment in the first place. So you can just see the, you know, the, a spread of, of responsibility and challenge associated with that. So I think this is my last slide, and what I propose to do is to not walk my way through all of it. Um, I want you to appreciate that this is just the technical side of challenges that lie ahead. There is this legal framework that we've been talking about, and business models and corporate responsibility that go well beyond the technical. But if we don't solve some of these technical problems, uh, that we don't have a hope of in enforcing any of the laws because if we don't have technical solutions, then telling somebody you're at fault and saying, and, but by the way, there isn't any way you could have avoided the problem uh, isn't a satisfactory outcome. I guess I should give you one pitch for uh, IPv6, especially considering that today is June 6th. And on June 6, 2012, uh, many of us uh, in the internet world announced that IPv6 uh, had to be implemented in order to allow the internet to continue to expand. We had run out of IPv4 address space <coughs> in, the, uh, uh, in the regional internet registries that allocate IP addresses, and ICANN had run out uh, of IPv4 address space uh, in that year as well. So uh, here we are, it's 2018, the penetration of IPv6 on a global scale is somewhere in the 25 to 30% range. So we still have quite a long ways to go. There are people who still resist implementing IPv6 in parallel with IPv4. Uh, and I think that each of us has an opportunity to beat on our internet access providers and ask them specifically, when are you going to be able to deliver IPv6 addresses to me in addition to IPv4? Now, <clears throat> just to... Uh, to offer a small anecdote about this. When Bob Kahn and I did the original design of the internet in 1973, we actually tried to figure out how big we should make the address space. And we knew that it needed to be global because the Defense Department had to operate everywhere in the world where it was needed. Um, and so we said, well, okay, first of all, how many networks will there be per country? We just finished building the ARPANET. That was not a trivial thing to do. So we thought, well, maybe there'll be two national scale networks per country, so there'll be some competition. <clears throat> and then we said, how many countries are there? And there wasn't any Google to ask at the time. This is 1973. So we guessed in 128, because that's a power of two, and that's what programmers think in. <laughs> so two times 128 is 256. So that's eight bits of network address. And then we said, how many computers will there be per network? And we said, well, how about 16 million? And that's 24 bits. Remember, we're doing this at a time when computers were giant, expensive machines that were in air-conditioned rooms that did not get up and wander around or didn't fit in your pocket. So uh, that was a 32-bit address space. That was um, 4.3 billion terminations, if fully, you know, uh, densely allocated, which was more than there were people in the world at the time. So I thought, well, that's surely enough to do an experiment. And then I thought, if this experiment works, then we would do a production version of the internet. Well, in 1989, when the first commercial internet services started, the IPv4 address space escaped into the commercial public world. And so, you know, if I had it to do all over again, you know, would I propose to use 128-bit addresses? To be honest, can you imagine saying to your colleagues, okay, we're gonna design this global internet thing. Okay, so how big is the address space? It's 128 bits, they do the math. It's 3.4 times 10 to the 38th addresses. 
you know, and you wouldn't pass the red face test. It would say, well, how on earth? And say, that's more addresses than there are electrons in the universe. <clears throat> By the way, that's not true. I said that once, and I got a note back from somebody in MI, and it was at Caltech. Dear Dr. Surf, you jerk, there's 10 to the 88th electrons in the universe. You're off by 50 orders of magnitude. So I don't say that anymore. <laughs> the point is that we could not have predicted, uh, or did not predict anyway, the proliferation of small devices and the proliferation of networks, which now confronts us. And so V6 is very important. Well, I will stop there. There's so much more to be said, but you have questions and I'll try to answer them. And in any case, I thank you very much for allowing me to take this time this morning. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Content and time management. Um, so, we, now what, we get to try the microphones. Ben, ben should get the we first have, shot. Yeah, we have to use the microphones, please. Ben. Ben, <clears throat> with all your experience of technology, <clears throat> AI, the whole thing, are you an optimist or a pessimist <clears throat> in the order of the next 100 years for humanity? So, uh, I'm, I am optimistic by nature. You know, I want to believe that we won't screw up too badly. Uh, but I also accept that uh, the more we um, design and build these mechanisms, uh, the more risk there is. The one thing uh, that I disagree uh, with uh, people like uh, uh, the late Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, and I align myself more with uh, Eric Schmidt, is that I believe that the artificial intelligence tools of today, the ones that we're using heavily uh, implementing uh, machine learning, are merely tools. And that, uh, that they need not be, um, become uh, a dominant force where the robots take over and you know, the human race becomes extinct. Uh, I do worry, however, not so much about the AI part, but about the autonomy of software independent of whether it is machine learning or AI or something or just plain code. When we hand autonomy off to the code, we are, in a sense, entrusting it to do the right thing. And I already got done haranguing bugs and things like that. I'm more worried about that than I am anything else. I'm, uh, and I'm also worried about the nefarious um, interests that some people have in disrupting infrastructure or you know, claiming or get, gathering access to devices and making botnets and so on. Nonetheless, uh, we have survived as a species over a long period of time. Um, it's kind of embarrassing though that the dinosaurs lasted a hell of a lot longer than we did. So we, you know, we have a long ways to go in some sense to assure our own uh, longevity. Uh, I believe that it's important for us to be aware of the risks and as technologists especially, we have a responsibility to draw attention to those risks and to propose responses in order to avoid the worst possible consequences. But the one thing that, which I believe is true of human beings, which so far has not been demonstrated by any artificial intelligence uh, computer-based system, is the ability to take a small amount of real-world input and to generalize from that to build models of the real world. I am personally, personally convinced that the way we interact with our real world is not based on what, the input that we're getting. It's based on the models we have built. And because we couldn't possibly process all this information and build new models in real time. What we do, however, is take the real world input and compare it to the models we have in our heads. And when the input doesn't match the models, the predictions of those models, then we change the models. But I'll give you an example of generalization, which I think characterizes what human beings can do that computers don't. We all know what a table is. A table is a flat surface that's perpendicular to the gravitational field. Okay, most people don't think of tables that way, but you know, we can think that way. Um, so any flat surface that has the property that is perpendicular to the gravitational field can serve as a table, an orange crate, uh, a laptop held you know, in this position, or your hands, or your lap, 
or a chair that you, that you sit on. All of those can be tables because of this property that we've identified and generalized from. That's the thing that human beings do that programs don't do right now, and I don't even know how you would represent that knowledge, how you would represent that information. That's one of the biggest struggles of artificial intelligence is to find a way to describe these models that allow you to reason about the properties of the real world. That's, it, it, attempts were made, for example, rule-based systems, like don't jump out of the window on the 10th floor because gravity works. It's not the fast, it may be the fastest way to get to the first floor, but it's probably not the safest way to get to the first floor. That's real world knowledge. I think that we are far away from computers that can do that. The scariest thing in any scenario is that we think they can do that and we hand over responsibility to those machines to reason for us about the real world. That I would worry about. Okay, it's a good question, Ben. I saw a hand up way in the back. Yeah, there he yeah. is. Please. Can you hear me? I uh, can. Although. First of all, many thanks for a very interesting presentation. Um, for, to answer your question, uh, I think the creator of email was Ray Tomlinson from BBN Technologies. Wait, wait, wait. It, it, it's just echoey he enough. He says down that, here that I'm the email guy was Ray Tomlinson. I'm he sorry. says that yeah. the email Yo. guy was called Ray Tomlinson. Oh, Ray Tomlinson. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Did you have to look it up on, email, on, on Google or did you remember it? Uh, I work at BBN Technologies when he was there at that time, so I, I could you. meet him. Wow. Um, and my question is regarding the bugs. Would you, uh, what would you say on bringing more math to code where we can prove certain properties of our code such that it's bug free? Because now we just code thinking that there is some algorithm behind, but we don't check the properties of that algorithm. So would bringing math to code make us bug free? Okay, I did See? not get all that. Me neither. He oh, okay. Well, do you want me no, to go No, wait a minute. No. He said that he's interested in what you mentioned about bugs. Yes. And he said that, do you think that bringing maths into code would make our code eventually bug-free? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's interesting. Well, uh, yeah, what we want is, is the technological equivalent of mothballs, uh, you know, naphtha. Uh, so that sounds like it would be a great name for a software development programming environment <laughs> called Napfa, which takes care of bugs. Uh, it's the environment, programming environment, that I think is important. What I want is essentially a programming environment that sits on my shoulder and is looking at what I'm typing. And it says, while I'm typing the program, it says, uh, you just had a buffer overflow in the program. Says, what do you mean I have a buffer overflow? Look at line number 123. I'm sorry, I can't do this without moving my lips. I'm not very good at that. Uh, and so what do you mean? You know, so I look at nine, line number 123 and I discover, it's right, I have a buffer overflow. Or even if I can't quite get to that, if I could ask questions about the properties of the program I'm writing, like certain, certain characteristics that are preserved in the program, like this variable is never referenced unless it's already set. Oh, by the way, here's a good question for you, and you might win a beer out of this. If, uh, if uh, you ask someone, how many values can a five-bit register hold? Okay, and normally you think, okay, it's two to the fifth, right, 32. You're wrong. It turns out there's 33 possible values that can be held in a register of five bits. And you say, well, how can that be, blah, blah, blah. And the answer is, if it has not been set with any value at all, the 33rd value is unknown, unset. Not registered, you know, not, not set. And so uh, Ivan Sutherland is the one that taught me this trick. And so his point is very well taken, is that you don't want a program that references a register that's never been set. And of course, you have to have some way of resetting the it's been set value. So that's an extra bit somewhere that lets you assert whether or not the register has been set. Uh, so you don't want a piece of software that references a value that hasn't been set. You can imagine a piece of hardware that actually checks for that. So the unset bit is set as part of the initialization. And then when you put a value into it, that bit gets zeroed out so the register has a value. And as soon as you ask to unset that, the bit goes back on. So an attempt to ref reference that register would cause a fault in the hardware. 
So this is a trivial example in some sense, but it's, an, it's, it's a way of thinking about getting the hardware to cooperate with the software to help us avoid or at least detect the kinds of, frankly, stupid mistakes that we make. Any one of you who's ever written a piece of software that had a bug, if you're like me, you have a small dent in your forehead, at, when you finally figure out what the bug was, you know, it's, it's like this, how could I be so stupid? Uh, and that's how most of the bugs turn out to uh, happen. Okay, so good question. Uh, we have one up there. Do you have a microphone or no? So you can scream. And I, I can give you the, this one. Or you we can throw you that at him. No, no, just to the first row. Oh, okay. When you I'll take the them. Speaker, I'll right? tell you what. Let me do this. This, this is, this is part. Oh, well, no, no, no. I'm actually going to come up with my microphone here. <laughs> this is my little trick in case I have to lip read. Here you go. Okay. So first, I want to thank again for the presentation, and my question is about internet neutra neutrality. Uh, what's your thought about that? Because as far as I heard, in the United States, there's bill passing by to um, cancel it. Yes, it's a terrible idea. So I'm, I'm, oh, now I've got both microphones. This is cool. I am in control. Uh, okay, so let's talk about this. I guess I have to come down to do that. This is part of my health plan, which is running around with a microphone. Good, okay, you can have that back. All right, net neutrality. First of all, let me respond uh, from the U.S. point of view because there were certain conditions that uh, led to this debate over net neutrality. In 1996, there were 8,000 internet service providers in the United States. They were dial-up internet access providers. There were big modem banks. You could change the phone number to go to a different modem bank if you didn't like the service you were getting from an internet access provider. But along came broadband technology uh, giving you megabits as opposed to tens of kilobits of access. But that required a piece of equipment to be delivered to your home, either a cable modem for coaxial cable or an optical fiber uh, uh, modem or a digital subscriber loop modem on a copper cable. So that meant a truck roll to your house. It also reduced the number of options that you had as a subscriber from thousands to zero, one, or two. If you were in the rural parts of the country, zero. Nobody brought broadband capability out to the rural parts of the US. If you were in the suburban part of the country, you had a choice of one, typically either a telephone company or a cable company. If you were in the urban parts of town, you might have a choice of two, one, car, one cable company and one telephone company. So from the standpoint of the consumers, internet access became far less competitive. And what that does is uh, create a marketplace where it is not disciplined by competition. Now we have another problem. Let's suppose you're a cable company and you're offering cable television services, maybe video on demand, and also broadband internet to a consumer. Let's imagine that the broadband internet part of your offering is being used by someone else on the internet to provide that consumer with streaming video. Well, suddenly the cable company says, wait a minute, my internet service is being used to compete with my other offerings. Why don't I mess up the internet service a little bit so the other guy's video doesn't work and force the consumer back to my products? That's anti-competitive behavior. And the FCC, adopted a set of rules that said you shouldn't do that, that these anti-competitive behaviors, throttling, interference, charging extra, you know, depending on who the supplier of content was, or charging differentially, were all anti-competitive behaviors and should be uh, inhibited. So the FCC adopted a set of rules. Then the cable companies and the telcos came and said, this isn't fair. Uh, we are regulated under American law in two different titles of the Telecom Act, Title II and Title VI. Title II for telecom and Title VI for cable. And so it's not fair that we both offer internet services but we're being regulated differently. So the FCC of the day said, okay, why don't we just not regulate internet? So they moved it over to Title I, which is an unregulated information service. 
The next thing you know, you start to see anti-competitive behaviors. And so the FCC tries to enforce its net neutrality principles and gets taken all the way up to the Supreme Court and is told, dear FCC, you move the internet service into an unregulated title, you don't have any basis for interfering with internet services because you said it was unregulated. So the FCC goes home carrying its head. The next FCC says, well, let's fix that and move this back into Title II, the telecom uh, section, in order to have a basis for controlling anti-competitive behavior. The present FCC has chosen to abandon that. And so at this point, there are no protections against anti-competitive behaviors other than a statement of principles, but without any basis for enforcement. Now, if it were my choice, uh, I would say it's time to develop an Internet uh, Regulation Act that's part of the t uh, Telecom Act, separate from telecom and cable, which specifically instantiates those principles and gives force to the FCC to enforce them. It has little to do with content and has mostly to do simply with access and fair treatment for the consumer's choice for the consumer. So that's where I think we should be, but that's not where we are. Now, whether that's applicable here in Switzerland or to other parts of Europe, I don't know because it depends a lot on the dynamics of uh, internet access in the US. Okay, here's one. So I suggest that we take one more question. We have okay. a lady here who wants to ask something. I'm gonna something. run up with the, this thing. No, no, no. She will have a, well, who is it? She has her microphone. Yeah, I know she does, but I have to get up close enough to uh, read her lips if I have to. So this is, <laughs> I, this is part of my Geraldo shtick. Okay, so who, yes, here, here you are. Good. Hello. Hi. <laughs> you were talking about the limitations of machine learning, or you were indicating, hinting towards this. So where do you see, um, do you see a big desert coming up for the machine learning? Do you see it's going, there's going to be another big jump from instead of having one layer to having multiple layers to a new set of uh, features that we can Yes, use. okay, so again, I want to warn you that I'm not the expert on this, but, uh, but I can give you my, um, my cartoon model of what I think is going on. I guess I'll run back down here again. Just remember, this is my health plan. I, how many times do I get to go up and down the stairs? Okay, so machine learning. Um, here's the problem. Um, I have this little model of multi-layer neural networks and uh, at each boundary between a layer, a certain amount of information is sent from the upper layer to the next one down. Sometimes everything gets to go down, and sometimes you select portions of the uh, values of the uh, weights in the preceding layer. The decision about how much of the information is passed uh, at each layer is a design decision for a multi-layer neural network. The problem is that we don't have good intuition right now about exactly how we should structure the interface between the various layers. So what happens is you explore a variety of possible ways of passing information. Sometimes if everything goes down, it's a convolutional you know, uh, transition. In some cases, you actually throttle the amount of information. You pass only a few uh, states down into the next layer. So people experiment with a variety of different interfaces between the layers as they explore the functionality of a multi-layer network to do, to do useful work. I think the next step in current multi-layer networking is to automate the process of exploring the design space of the interfaces between the layers. And if we're lucky, we may begin to understand how the different choices uh, change the way in which the system uh, can either perform its function efficiently or resi resist the brittleness that I mentioned earlier about you know, mistaking uh, one vector for uh, a place on one side or the other of a hyperplane. So I think that's the most natural next step in the multi-layer network space. The deeper thing, and the thing that I'm still very curious about, is what happens when we start to introduce memory 
into the system so that it performs a, you know, you go through the multi-layer network and it does something. What happens if we remember the something that it did and build a feedback loop into the system? During the training process, that's what goes on. Because we run the system, we look at the outcome, we feed back error, and we try to find parameters that will reduce the errors. By the way, this only works well if you have an extremely well-defined error function, a way of, of assessing how well or poorly the network did what it was supposed to do. If you don't have a very good criteria, you know, quantitative criteria, this feedback loop doesn't work very well. So I think there's some deep insight that we're still looking for and don't have based on experience. I still think that, that even that step in the evolution is nowhere close to the ability to create models about which we can reason. And if, if, if we're looking for the next really big step in artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, it's the ability to discover and express and reason about models of the real world. Sometimes call this common sense knowledge. And this has been a, a, a sort of an objective of artificial intelligence for the many decades that that term has been around. But I'd say we are far from coming to uh, fruition on that uh, aspiration. So that's where I think we are. I think I have to stop here. I am very sorry, but we are uh, waited, expected somewhere. Uh, I have two things to say before we thank the speaker again. First of all, in, uh, in the CERN document server and linked from today's event, you will have the recording of this. The CERN document server has a brilliant function. There is a tab on discussion. So uh, you are encouraged, if you wish, to, to put comments there. This may inspire future uh, academic training events. I take the opportunity to re, re, re remind you to vote for the next academic year uh, via the questionnaire that uh, ha you have received multiple times. And uh, last but not least, infinitely thank you for crossing the Atlantic to give us this talk. Thank you very much. No, thank you very much. Thank you.